All right, Leo, welcome to the show. I'm really excited to have you here. Yeah, I'm excited too, Erica. Thank you so much for the invite. Of course. And this kind of happened because I have worked with some girls on your teams and a lot of girls who have worked with you in the past. And they're like, you need to interview Coach Leo. And I actually made note of some of the comments they've made about you, not to scare you right off the bat, but I wrote some of them down. So I thought these were amazing. And I'll read just a, a few of them here. So one girl said, uh, Leo is strict, but not in a punishment way. He is strict in a way that actually teaches the game. So I thought that was a cool one. Uh, another one is Leo's practices are high quality, and there is a lot of detail behind what he is teaching. I learned so much from Leo. This is another one. And I wish he coached my age group. <laughs> And then this was an amazing one from a dad of a girl. He said, Leo is meant to coach young girls. So, I mean, those are just wonderful. And you are local to the Tampa area. You work with uh, Florida Premier ECNL teams. So I'm just curious your journey and how you ended up in uh, coaching girls today and just that whole process. So feel free to tell the listeners. Okay, good. So my um, my story with soccer starts with um, when I was really like young. Um, my my dad loved soccer, and uh, and and, um, and 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 I, and I grew up just like sharing sharing that passion with him. Right, he was watching soccer on TV the whole time. So um, this is how the game grew for me. And uh, when I was six years old, um, the World Cup happened in France, and and France won the World Cup in nineteen ninety eight. Uh, so I guess this was really like the moment where um, I really like fell in love completely like with the game um and then soccer has always been around me because uh in france and in paris from where i'm from um just soccer is everywhere so this this has always been like um a part of uh, a part of my life uh i never played professional i actually never really played in a in a structured um environment until i was 16 or 17 years old um just because uh, I'm from the center of the city in Paris, and there's no club. Um, and really, like, yeah, just my parents didn't like got me to to a club. So I just like learned the game, you know, like playing outside um, in the neighborhood with my friends. And this is how really, like, I guess I really like grow the love of the, of, of the game, like, um, organically, you know, um, from from that. And then um, in uh, in college, I studied sports performance because I've always been really like interested in how like. Uh, athletes are able to just like perform the way they they do um, at a high level, and uh, and um, and 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 I was really like conciliating my love of soccer um, with my studies. So this is what I loved my college time because I was able to play um, play for the college team. I was also like playing in the club at that time uh, at a semi professional level, uh, and then also I was studying sports performance. So this was a great time for me, and then. Um, I got the chance right at the end of um, my uh, master degree um, to be hired by Paris Football Club. So after the PSG, is the second professional club in Paris. Um, and then I, I guess at age 22, I was enrolled in this position of like uh, the fitness coach of the of the um, of the men's academy. So U17, U19, and uh, and I was working in a professional environment starting my 22 years old. So. This is really like um, uh, my journey to the to the game from me being a young um, like uh, game lover to uh, a soccer uh, professional um, employee, you know. Uh, and then um, and then in Paris FC at age 22, um, I was just learning a lot. Um, and then uh, I, um, I I moved to another club two years after. Um, and this club was called the Havre. It's in like Normandy, so west of France. And the president uh, is actually American, and um, he brought um, uh, um, girls from America that were um, done playing in college. So they were ending their college career, and they wanted to play professional in France. Um, so I went to work in that club, and uh, and this is where I, m I met my wife, uh, Shannon, because. She, uh, she, she, she was coming to uh, to play overseas in France, and uh, and I was working in the club 
uh, where where she played. So uh, after two years of uh, her playing in France, uh, she uh, she uh, she offered me to come here to uh, to America to Tampa, and this is how I arrived here. So this is my journey. <laughs> Oh, wow. That is such an awesome journey. And I think it's so cool that you're someone who just developed that passion for the game and then studied performance and how the human body works. And I think a a lot of coaches who also have that performance education are amazing coaches because they understand fatigue and recovery and the periodization, which we'll get into, but how long have you been coaching at Florida Premier and which age groups are you working with? Okay. So um, I I arrived in America in Tampa five years ago. And basically after three months I was here, I got the chance to be introduced to um, our club. Um, And since then I've always been there because the motto of our club is uh, one club, one family. And this is really like how I feel. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I really feel like this club is my family. And, uh, when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about the employee, but all the, the people around. And I think that's one of the, yeah, the success of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of me working with people that I really like care about and they care about me. So I think this is like a very, just like positive relationship, um, between the people I'm working with. Um, and the, the, the age group that I'm coaching this year are going to be the 2010, so they are U15, and the 2008, so they are U17. I was previously with the 2007 uh, for five years, so uh, it's going to be the last, uh, the last year for them at the club, and it's going to be actually the first year for them uh, without me as their, as their coach. <laughs> So let's talk about your teams, uh, the 2010s. Uh, I know a lot of people listening have heard of them because they've had such a good record over the years. Uh, what do you think has led to the success of that team on the national scale? Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously, like the first thing as a coach that you always have to recognize is the talent of your player. Um, and, and, and talent is something that you absolutely want to cultivate. But in my opinion, talent is... Um, the natural abilities, you know, of, of players. And, and, and this is an age group that, that have plenty of it, right? Um, after that, I think this talent has been cultivated um, since the beginning from the coach that um, these girls had at the club uh, before me. So I took them two years ago when they were uh, 13 years old. But before that, at, from age 10 to 13, they were with a coach, Coach David Dos Santos, that's been extremely extremely um beneficial for them uh when it comes to developing their talents you know um coach david has the ability to really like develop the individual technical abilities of the player which um in my opinion in the periodization of the individual player development um is key at this age you know i think that from age 10 to 13 the ability to develop individual technical skills is just so, so, so important. And Coach David is amazing with that. So uh, when the girls came to me at age 13 and they were starting their 11 v 11 journey, so on a bigger field, when the tactical and physical aspect of the game becomes more important, uh, I was able to focus on these things because the girls were absolutely ready technically. And I believe that, um, you know, like creating um, an organization and a structure within the, the different like skills that you're teaching to the players within their curriculum is, is key in the player development. So what are some of the technical and tactical training non-negotiables girls at this level in the ECNL should have and that you're really hammering home with them? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, what we're talking about curriculum and, and, and things you have to be able to have as you come within the ECNL program um, based on the game, the game principle that we want to apply because we have a clear idea of how we want our teams to play. Um, and then obviously the quality that we're looking for a play, from a player are based on these um, uh, game principles that we want to implement. So we want to be uh, a club with teams that really want to like dominate by uh, having possession of the ball. We want to have the ball. We want to be able to keep the ball as high as possible of the field. Uh, we want to be able to have players that take on players 1v1, that express their um, technical domination. And, and, and for this, we really want players that are super strong technically. So 
I believe when players arrive um, at age 13 to our program, we want them to have a great relationship with the ball. Uh, when I'm talking about a good relationship with the ball, I mean, are you able to dribble with your right and with your left foot? Are you able to use your inside, your outside of the foot? Um, are you able to trap the ball from the air with almost like every part of your body, you know, with your inside, your thigh, your chest? Um, and then are you able to juggle the ball? Because I believe that a good juggler is a player that has already developed a good relationship with the ball. Um, and then as we progress into um, U13 and the more like tactical aspect of the game, um, I really believe that for me, the ability to scan, take information, um, and to be able to do that, you have to have a good body position. So for me, I guess, um, before they come to us, it's the relationship with the ball. And then when they start being with us, it's can you take the right information? Because decision making is the main concept that we're looking to teach with players. So uh, body position as player receive the ball is, in my opinion, the main content when we work with players from 13 to 17, 19 years old. I love to hear that because body position is something so simple, but there are some coaches who don't really work on it that much at this age. And you see a lot of those errors uh, with this age group of girls, uh, even at some of the showcases. And I used to work in college recruiting and I would see it at the ID camps and I'm like, they should know this by now. <laughs> so I'm really glad that that's a focus for you guys. Now, in terms of teaching that body position, what types of drills or cues are you giving to get them in the right positions or to help them to scan better and just be more aware of their environment? Right. So um, there's different ways to implement that, right? You can, you, can, you can do it in a more like, um, I guess, repetitive and um, um, structured way where within a passing pattern, right? you're going to have the players focusing on uh, the angle of their body as they receive. You know, like, uh, can they make sure that they share their body position between where the ball is coming from and their targets? For me, like, that's, that's, that's the concept here. Because when you're able to share your position uh, from where the ball is coming from and from where the ball should be going, then now you have a clear idea of um, what's going to be the right decision. As the ball travel, I'm able to um, look towards my target. My target can be the goal, right? If I need to be going to goal, but my target can be one of my teammates. Um, and then always being able to have a clear idea of, um, because the game is evolving, right? Of course, the goal is not moving, but my teammates are moving. So if my target is a teammate, I need to always be able to have an eye on where is that player is going? Is that player still an option as I receive, or is that player like now under pressure, right? Is the space that I'm looking for uh, still open? If it's still open, how open it is? And if it's maybe not open, then now as I receive the ball, my decision-making is going to be different. So uh, sharing the body position between where the ball is coming from and my targets is key concept. You can work on that through a pattern, like I said, uh, more like with beginners and maybe for like more expert player, at the beginning of the session just to like implement that concept back um, after you can implement it also in a small sided game where you're always in a 4v2 rondos for example right you're always going to force the player to receive with their back foot because if they have to receive with their back foot that means that as they receive they have created an angle that would allow them to um, face the opposite side of the ball and that's actually what you want to teach when you implement uh, principles such as keeping the ball, movement of the ball, ball circulation. So this is really like the main concept to me, like receiving on the half turn, um, sharing your body position to face your target and then receiving with your back foot. So now your execution technically can um, link your idea of what you're going to try to do. And it's those details that make the difference between either being a step ahead or a step behind. And I'm a big fan of developing speed. I mean, I'm a performance coach, but if you can't combine that with that cognitive piece, then 
you might not be as fast as someone who's slower, but is thinking faster than you. So I, I love that you're just doing so much in that sense. Now, is there any philosophy or mentor that you had? I know you mentioned your dad and looking up to the French national team. Is there any anyone else in your life who inspired you? Um, so the, um, there was I, when I was in college, there was this game, you know, when Pop Guardiola was the coach at Barcelona. And, and 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 that team with this like magic midfield with Busquets, um, uh, Iniesta, and Xavi was in place. But you also had like amazing player like Messi and and all that in the in the team. But then um, one day that team played against Real Madrid and and, and they won five zero. Um, and then Real Madrid was like full of like super athletic and strong players like Cristiano Ronaldo, Pepe, like Xavi Alonso, all these like super athletic guys. And these guys have been destroyed by the little ones that would just like be much smarter and much better on the ball. And that that game has inspired my vision of 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 soccer. And I think I remember after that game, I was in college and I was like finding my way of like willing to coach. And I said, this is what I want to create. No matter what level I'm like working at, um, even if it's like with the younger ones, like this is exactly how I want my team to play. And and I've been so much inspired by the fact that uh, in soccer, technique and brain are more important than, you know, like muscle and legs, you know? Uh, this is obviously like not negotiable. You have to run when you play soccer. However, if you're able to run smarter and you're able to be connected with the players around you, in my opinion, you're unstoppable, right? And this is really like, um, this coach, Pep Guardiola, is today an inspiration for me. I try to watch like as much of the game that he's coaching uh, today with Man City because I think that the, the level of um, uh, collective intelligence in that team is just like unmatched. Uh, and that's what I love about the game is when we are so much in sync as a group, it's like when we close our eyes, we're able to like know where each other are we have a clear idea of what we want to be able to do offensively and defensively and when we're able to reach that stage of like collective ability to feel each other without even talking and and, and do that this is where i i feel the most like happy as a coach um so i guess yeah uh, pep guardiola is a big inspiration for me when it comes to how i want the game to be played but you know in my journey here uh, as i came to uh, to america and, and working with youth female athletes was really new for me when I arrived here, you know, so it was such a new experience and such a new environment on the social and emotional aspect. I also had a lot to learn and people like our club's director, Gibo Corda, um, uh, by the time she was a, 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 a program director, now today she's the, she's the Suns head coach, Dennis Brown, she's like a, a huge like mentor for me um, as well. Um, I've had like lots of mentors since I, since I came here. So, um, yeah, I guess that's my answer. Yeah. <laughs> so Denise has also been on the podcast. She is fantastic and just such a great soccer mind. And I also figured you were going to mention some Spanish style of play was your inspiration and it makes so much sense, but it is really inspiring. And I, I think a lot of players in the U S especially are like, we need to focus on being athletic. And yes, we do. Everyone can get faster and stronger. It will benefit you. But if you're not training the mind and how to be a tactically good player at the same time, then it's not going to be optimal. So I'm so glad you you touched on that. And it's also inspiring for like the young girl soccer players who are more late developers. So they're not getting as tall as their peers and maybe they're shorter, but they can lean into their technical skills. They can lean into thinking quicker than the taller or faster girl. So it's really inspiring and it's why soccer is so exciting. <laughs> it's really cool. So I, you because, um, yeah. I, I think one of the beauty of soccer is that every athletic profile can succeed in this game. You know, you can have your tall, and uh, a little bit like slower person get, can probably be like an amazing like uh, target nine, you know, mm -hmm. and then you can have your uh, super small but um, extremely quick and, 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 and clean technically player that can be like an amazing like number 10 playmaker, right? And 
um, every 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 profile have their place have their place uh, I guess in soccer it's really like um, what you're able to do with your quality can you make sure that uh, your strengths uh, are really like something that are going to benefit um, the team and this is really what I believe in the most. Mm-hmm. Now, I know that your teams are practicing quite a bit. Is it three times a week or four times a week? So this season, um, we are training four times a week, um, three times being a a soccer uh, session, and then one time being a gym session. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you about that because the the ECNL is a really high level. It's becoming more demanding for these girls, and I've – heard a lot of girls mention that you're really good at just tweaking the load each practice and just really understanding fatigue and the importance of recovery. So I guess just walk us through a sample practice week and how you're structuring your sessions at the beginning of the week. And then at the end, when we get close to weekend games, because a lot of coaches don't get the periodization down and I've seen injuries happen as a result. So for me, like, when you when you look at a session you have to consider that session within different temporality right so um you have to look at this session within the week but also within the months and then also within the year right so for me this is really like how you can um um optimize um the 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 tactical the sorry the the physical development of the player because each session has a purpose uh based on their weekly schedule but also their monthly schedule and also the the the, the, the yearly schedule so um we work with uh like cycles so when you look at your season you see that they are like big pieces, right? So for example, um, we have started the first week of August. I think it was August 2nd or 3rd, I don't remember. Um, and then our first uh, league games uh, starts September 7th, right? So we have five weeks to prepare our girls to be able to experience two games back to back. And obviously like the rules of ECNL allow us to make subs within the first half um, and be able to re-enter the player. Uh, However, what we have, and that was really new for me when I arrived in America, right? Um, Players play two games back to back, which is like insane when you consider like how um, impacting the the game load can be on their body, right? Because me, I'm still playing, right? And when I play one game, I feel like I need like three or four days to recover from it, right? But but our girls are just super here because they are able to play a game and then just sleep through the night and be ready to play another game, which I think is just like insane and amazing from from, from them. But we have to be able to, to consider that. So um, we have five weeks to prepare uh, and every every session are organized during preseason towards that goal. Can our girls can be ready uh, to play two games the, the 7th and the 8th of September, right? So um, we have like each week um, design so we can develop athletic abilities from our player and make sure they have enough time to rest because the adaptation of the overload during the training happens during the recovery. So you have to always have this model in mind where it is great to push your athletes because this is how you create adaptation and adaptation leads to development. However, if you don't respect this like gap of time where players need to rest, then adaptation doesn't happen. And then now instead of having athletic development, you have athletic underdevelopment and athletic underdevelopment can lead to injury. So um, this is like, we have different like tools to evaluate um, the the intensity and the volume. Uh, obviously, our eye as expert coach is the main tool that we have. Unfortunately, we don't have any like GPS or um, cardio heart rate monitor um, for the for the player. And to be honest, within our staff, like we are not equipped to be able to um, quantify uh, individual load for 
the 70, 80 players that we have within the program. However, like we're trying at the collective level to be as accurate as possible when it comes to evaluating the, the training load. So um, I hope I'm not being like too uh, vague in the, in, in the explanation, but um, basically we make sure that since every Saturday we have a game and sometimes we have games Saturday and Sunday during preseason, we're managing the week so girls can pick for these two days. Um, so usually Monday is our reintroduction, uh, reintroduction session, so it's not super hard. And then we progress harder from Monday to Tuesday and Wednesday is our highest session when it comes to intensity and volume. And then Thursday is a very, very light session. Friday is off. So by deloading the players on Thursday and on Friday, we are hoping that they can create this compensation that's going to allow them to pick as they arrive on, on Saturday. That was a fantastic explanation. I think you really simplified it for coaches at the macro level and then at the micro level for the training week. And you made a good point there that load management is not necessarily babying the athletes, but it's more so building them up to handle the demands of the game. So we don't want to under train them. There are times to go hard and to be intense. And I figured that Wednesdays was that day for you typically. So I really like that because I think some people think load management is, you know, sitting players out of drills and cutting out things, but there's like this push and pull of the right balance of high intensity and low intensity. So that's a really great point. Now, um, my last question as we wrap this up are, what are some things you feel the American girls soccer player of today really needs and just any advice you have? Yeah. Um, again, I, I, I think, um, you know, like each, uh, each, each context, each environment is different. America is such a big country. Um, so, you know, like I feel like giving an advice to like, just like American girls would be too much like um, uh, general. And I, I, I'd like to be a little bit more like, I guess maybe like specific, but I guess from the environment that I grew up in, I think the main difference uh, with what I see here um, is the structure versus unstructured environment. So, um, and this is something we as a club, we try to implement sometimes. It's not, it's not that easy, right? But I, I think that um, there are a lot of like skills and abilities that player uh, will learn in a very like unstructured environment where they would just be playing like a small sided game with their friends, with their peers, um, without having to uh, have like uh, parents watching or uh, a referee refereeing the game, you know, like just this kind of game that probably you played when you were younger and yeah, you invite like three or four of your friends and then okay, you guys play 3v3 in your backyard, and then this is where you're trying your skills. This is why you train, you, you, you try new things. And um, this is really like, I think, how you develop um, uh, the, the instincts of, uh, of the players. Because within a, a structured environment like ours, right, so we can go very like deep into the details of technical execution, right? How you have to position yourself tactically. And then uh, at some point, the inspiration of the player has to come up. However, in, in, in our environment, um, it is not always the best place to learn that, right? And uh, this is where I, I, I see we have players that because of the culture of their parents, because of yeah how they've been uh, put around, they've had the chance to play this like very uh, unstructured little like small side games. And then when they come to our environment, where they can take benefits of like all the detailed coaching that we can provide, then they take the best out of both worlds. And this is where they become the best version of themselves soccer wise, you know? So my really like my biggest advice for, for young players is can you try to go out and organize games by yourself, make them as competitive as you want. And really like that's going to be the best way for you to uh, improve individually. Brilliant. I'm glad we ended on that. So Leo, thank you for everything you're doing for 
all the girls that you coach. Thank you for sharing your methods. And I really hope the coaches listening are inspired by this conversation to really understand periodization and load management. And I think it should be a non-negotiable for every coach of a youth soccer team to, to learn about these things. So thank you, Leo. And I will see everyone on the next episode.